Video games. I love them. They are my favorite medium of entertainment. The ability to be a part of the story that unfolds around you. You drive the plot. You save the day. You decide the outcome. But what really makes video games interesting are the characters that you interact with when you play them. You may be the main character, but you're nothing without your allies and adversaries. They add variety and different points of view throughout your adventures. Today I have amassed a list of my 10 favorites. Take note that I am excluding characters that originated in other versions of media, like Harley Quinn or Scarecrow, and there will be all types of spoilers for all types of games ahead, so fair warning. Here they are, my top 10 favorite video game characters. Number 10 Nick, Left 4 Dead 2 Left 4 Dead 2 is a great game. Good story, great gameplay, and a wonderful co-op multiplayer. When I first opened up my copy of Left 4 Dead 2, I had to decide who to play as, and for me, the obvious choice was Nick. Smooth talker, rich gambler, tough ladies man Nick is a super cool dude. Wearing a $10,000 suit in the zombie apocalypse is nothing to sneeze at, and his violent past as a con man make him an excellent choice of friend when fighting the undead. That is, when he is willing to be a team player. He is reluctant to join the team at first, though over the course of the campaigns, he opens up more to the group and reveals a kinder side. His appearance is based on Tamor Ghazi, and I mean, wow, that is a spot-on model of this guy they put into the game. Many of his quotes are funny and enjoyable to hear. Oh my god. You do that again, and I will bury you alive. Though they're also pretty tough and often violent. Gunfight! A lot like Nick. All in all, Nick is an awesome character to play as, and I hope he makes some kind of appearance in Left 4 Dead 3. Number 9. Lee Everett, The Walking Dead. Ah, good old Lee. Lee Everett was a history teacher before he murdered a state senator for sleeping with his wife. On his way to prison, the zombie apocalypse began, saving him from incarceration and setting him on a path of redemption. Though you can choose how Lee acts around others, most people play him as a kind-hearted man eager to help his friends and protect those close to him. His main objective in life is to protect Clementine, a young girl who he treats like a daughter. The whole game allows for dynamic interactions with the characters and the now-ended world around him as he and his group of friends attempt to survive. Through his kind actions and words, he quickly becomes a leader and is generally loved by all if you play the right way. The Walking Dead is an emotional roller coaster full of ups and downs, but one of the saddest moments in gaming history is the ending. In saving Clementine, the one thing left Lee cares about, he is bitten by a walker and is slowly dying. In a gut-wrenching moment, he tells Clementine to shoot him as he lay weak on the floor. This scene brought many to tears, me included. Lee has cemented himself in gaming culture as one of the greats, and he will be greatly missed. Number 8. Zero. Borderlands 2. A mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in a haiku is how one may describe Zero the Assassin. Little is known about what he is or what he's done. He's wanted for political assassination and teams up with Maya, Axton, Salvador, Craig, Gage, and the citizens of Sanctuary to rid Pandora of the Hyperion Corporation and its leader, Handsome Jack. This guy is uber cool. Besides the fact that no one knows what he looks like under that mask, or if he's even human, he can create a decoy hologram of himself to distract opponents as he becomes invisible and stabs them in the back with his katana. His skills are amazing and ultra powerful, especially things having to do with critical hits and melee strikes. Another interesting and mysterious fact about him is that he only speaks in haiku. The true world revealed. Weakness is now known to me. Time to go to work. A new instrument waiting for a sonata that I will conduct. Leaves falling from trees, snow drifting onto the ground, life leaving your corpse. I am bored as hell. I would like to kill something. Can we freaking go? How hilarious. You just set off my trap card. Your death approaches. His play style of critical hits and sneaky deception, coupled with his cool as a cucumber attitude, makes him my favorite vault hunter in the Borderlands games. <laughs> you're, you're really cool. <laughs> Number seven. Reese, Tales from the Borderlands. Tales has got to be one of my favorite games of all time. 
Telltale's signature choice based style mixed with Borderlands characters and humor to spice things up. A perfect recipe if you ask me. One of the two characters you play as is Reese, a Hyperion salaryman, looking to become the next handsome Jack. He instead ends up with the actual one, or an AI of the actual one, lodged in his cranium. Though he is one of the two main characters, I have to say he is more of the main character than Fiona. I mean sure she's cool and all, but Reese is the real plot driver, with most of the game changing choices being made by him. Also, who could forget about this classic? Good times. Good times. He's a real funny guy. Well, that's not saying much in this game, but Troy Baker gives this character life as a relatable worker who has aspirations of being on top. He has many heartfelt moments with his friends and allies, and is generally more fun to play with his hacking abilities and the freaking Jackopedia. You have to admit, that was one of the highlights of the game right there. He also is better than Fiona in that, when you play as him, you have way better and funnier characters to interact with. Let me give you a little list. Handsome Jack, Vaughn, Loaderbot, Vasquez, Dumpy. Boom. Point made. The only really funny ones Fiona has are Scooter and I guess Gordis. Whether you play him as a power-hungry Hyperion executive or a caring friend, I did both, you can't deny who the real Vault Hunter was in this epic tale. Number 6. Dr. Edward Richthofen, in Call of Duty World at War. Being a crazy Nazi scientist makes Richthofen a very interesting character. Well, the crazy scientist part, not, not, not the Nazi part. Throughout the rounds of Undead Slaughter, he will speak about things such as spleens, doom coughs, the Illuminati, as well as his master plot. Said master plot involves using his former test subjects to zombie killing buddies to help him obtain artifacts necessary to teleport to the moon, who'd switch bodies with Samantha Maxis to take control of all the zombies on the Earth! He then later guides the transit group through the mind of one Samuel Stuhlinger to activate certain towers and allow the two to share some headspace. He is then for some reason sent back to World War I to free Samantha from Agartha. Now not insane, so less fun. However, after stealing the summoning key in Shadows of Evil, killing his future self for unexplained reasons, and appearing in the giant, he is slowly getting his old crazy quirks back. The insane things he shouts as you explore German theaters, Cambodian temples, and the freaking moon are his best qualities. If it be cut into a thousand pieces, yay! The doctor is in! A hammer to bash their brains! Oh no, the windows. You know, I really think this whole war thing could have been worked out over a nice little schnapps. Dempsey, I hate you. I hate your ugly voice. Don't be afraid of death. Be afraid of the doctor! I have been recognized by Treya, the, the Illuminati! If I had a spleen for every second I waited for this infernal machine, I would have at least 50. He is quite amusing and a joy to play as, all around a great character from one of the most complicated yet interesting storylines out there. Number 5 Kenny, The Walking Dead. When gamers talk about Kenny, there are two main opinions. You either love him, or you hate him. It all depends on your choices throughout The Walking Dead, and personally, I love the guy. He becomes Lee's best friend and ally if you side with him, and he has many funny things to say. He's just a man looking out for his family. He has a short temper due to him being a stereotypical redneck, but he is kinda hard and does what he feels is best for those he cares about. After his quote unquote death in season 1, I was deeply saddened. He was one of my favorites. But when he makes his most triumphant return in Season 2, I shed a single manly tear of joy. I got lucky. Real lucky. My old drinking buddy was back. Though you're like 11 in that game, so maybe no drinking. Or maybe just a little. <laughs> Even after losing his entire family, his best friend, his eye, and his later girlfriend, Kenny is still a serious machine at wrecking the undead. And this guy. He really wrecked this guy. When the final episode of Season 2 came around and Kenny and Jane began to fight, I didn't even help Jane when there was a quick time event to do so. You don't mess with the beard. Hashtag feed the beard. Then the game gave me the option to shoot Kenny. Why would I do that? Jane's in the wrong. 
Okay, let's look at the stats here. Kenny, your foster dad's best friend who is always ready to help and looking out for you, versus a near stranger who abandoned your group once and seems to have recently murdered slash abandoned a baby? Yeah, pretty tough choice. How could so many people shoot him? What is wrong with you people? What do you mean, you people? Sorry, sorry. Anyway, when Kenny finishes stabbing that witch in the chest, I smiled. He won. We won. Then the baby is actually still alive, so that whole sequence was kind of pointless. And it gives you the option to kill him again. Uh, no. Eventually, Clem, Kenny, and Alvin Jr. reach Wellington, the place you've been trying to reach the whole game. They say they'll let you and Junior in, but Kenny has to stay behind. Though he urges you to do so, I refused. There is no way I'm leaving Kenny to fend for himself in the woods. Nuh uh, no way, Jose. At this point, I'm a waterfall of tears. At first, at the idea of leaving Kenny, but then tears of joy when I stick with him and walk majestically into the sunset as the credits roll. Ah, uh, good memories. However, he is now a determinate character. He now has the determinate curse placed on him. In The Walking Dead, whenever a character can either live or die due to a choice, they always end up dead one way or another. Sometimes soon, sometimes later, but it will happen. I'm praying to the telltale gods to let it not be true this time. Or at least let him go down fighting in the most bad A way possible, late into season 3, protecting Clem and AJ. <laughs> wow, that was a long speech. Oh well, Kenny's awesome, on to the next character. You're as stubborn as a damn mule. Yeah? Wonder where I got that from. Number 4 Marlton Johnson, Call of Duty Black Ops 2 Being an engineer, Marlton is highly intelligent, and he's not afraid to show it. So much technology all in one package, like me. This device will prove my mental superiority once and for all. He may have worked in or near the Nuketown facility, as he can be found hiding out in a bunker as zombies attack the site. However, eventually he was banished from somewhere, perhaps the facility where he worked, where he was reporting suspicious behavior, most likely zombie activity. After a missile launched from the moon strikes the base, he is the only survivor. Marlton then travels to Hanford where he meets Abigail Misty Briarton, whom he teams up with to fight the undead hordes. Eventually, Samuel Stuhlinger and Russman arrive in a commandeered bus and the three become a survival group. As I said before, Marlton is highly intelligent, especially when it comes to guns. The cap, a pistol with the recoil system of a rifle? The designer was indecisive and has crafted a subpar weapon. He has an affinity for sniper rifles as he enjoys killing zombies from a fairly safe distance away the SVU being his favorite. He uses a highly advanced vocabulary which often confuses his other, less bright teammates. I predict a homonecrosis spatter pattern of about 20 meters. Exemplary example of a duplicative drive destined to end in disaster. And considers himself intellectually superior to all around him. Tis a pity, but sometimes the weak must die so the superior can thrive. He has many attributes of the stereotypical nerd, such as a pocket protector, glasses tape, and germophobia. He is quite narcissistic, though somewhat self-conscious. Throughout their adventures, Marlton becomes very close with Misty. Though he claims he doesn't feel emotions, he obviously has a crush on her, which luckily for him, is reciprocated. He however dislikes Samuel, mainly for his overall incompetence, but he hates Russman most of all. Russman, I need to test this weapon's rate of fire! Hold still! From the beginning, the two are at odds, and this doesn't really change throughout the story, though Marlton does show some sympathy for him in the cutscene for Buried. Many of his lines I find witty and funny. My endeavors will aid all mankind. Well, me, primarily, but through me, all mankind. And from the moment I first played as him, he has been my favorite character in Nazi Zombies. After the ending of Buried, whether you side with Richthofen or Maxis, I fear the worst may have fallen upon the Engineer of Destiny. I pray he and the Green Run crew make a return in a DLC map for Black Ops 3. Courtesy of your resident genius. Number 3. Handsome Jack. Numbers 2 and 3 were tough to choose between. They're almost interchangeable, but I gave Jack number 3 as number 2 and I have a little bit more history. 
Abused from an early age, Jack's mental instability began to form early on in his life. After being married and having a daughter, Angel, who turned out to be a very rare and powerful being called a Siren, his wife was killed by Angel accidentally, as she could not fully control her powers. Jack, being a skilled programmer for the Hyperion Corporation, created technology to harness and contain Angel and her powers. He then used her abilities to contact the first group of Vault Hunters and trick them into opening a vault containing the Destroyer, a powerful alien entity. After its death, Jack took its eye for use, which was his plan all along. He hooked it up to the Hyperion space station in progress, Helios, dubbing the superweapon the Eye of Helios. After recruiting more Vault Hunters to keep it from the hands of the Doll Corporation, he is betrayed by his friends Lilith, Roland, and Moxie, as they try to destroy the Eye as well as kill him. He escapes and opens a vault on Elpis, Pandora's moon, and finds a relic containing knowledge from the Iridians, an ancient race of people who are highly intelligent. He begins a knowledge transfer, absorbing data from the relic straight into his brain. He sees the future, him opening the vault of the warrior before Lilith destroys the relic, causing it to severely scar his face. This new knowledge, coupled with the scarring and the betrayal, causes Jack to be driven insane. He murders the president of Hyperion and takes over the company for himself, deconstructing a mask of his own face to hide the branding. From here on out, he begins calling himself Handsome Jack and slowly builds Hyperion's power, as well as creating propaganda stating he opened the Vault of the Destroyer, wiped out the Crimson Lance, and performed many more heroic acts. He then takes over Pandora, making himself dictator, and begins work on opening the Vault of the Warrior. Throughout Borderlands 2, he calls himself the hero of the story, and calls the Vault Hunters you play as the bad guys. Bandits. His mission is to bring peace to Pandora by wiping out all violent bandit settlements and destroying much of the dangerous wildlife that inhabits Pandora. He uses his daughter's siren powers to charge the Vault Key. However, she is unhappy in being enslaved and allows the Vault Hunters to kill her. This sets Jack off, appearing physically for the first time in the game to kill Roland and kidnap Lilith to replace Angel. He repeatedly calls you child killer and even says this chilling line. What's that saying? Don't pick a fight with a man with nothing left to lose. See, I'm gonna show you just how much you have to lose, and I got the most powerful siren on the planet to do it with. Though it may not have seemed like it, he cared for his daughter greatly, and her death inflames his hatred for all Vault Hunters even more. He eventually opens the vault, releasing the warrior, an ultra-powerful being capable of destroying planets, whom he sicks on the Vault Hunters. They eventually kill it before confronting Handsome Jack for the last time. However, down to his dying breath, he still believes that he is the hero. You are a bandit, and I am the goddamn hero! And just like that, Jack is gone. Well, not exactly. A Hyperion scientist, Dr. Nakayama, obsessed with Jack, saved his consciousness as an AI in an ID drive, which is picked up by Reese, a Hyperion middle manager, who then plugs it into his head. Jack then follows him throughout his adventures, heavily influencing Reese as well as the plot. He seems to want to help Reese become the president of Hyperion, until eventually it is revealed that his true goals are to upload his consciousness into an endoskeleton, which would be placed into Reese's body. Being highly against this, Reese crashes Helios from space, and in an epic and emotional scene, finishes off Jack, either crushing the eye he is contained in, or keeping him prisoner in it. I'm sorry, Jack. It's over. I kept it, so he may be able to have a triumphant return later on. Now, after all of this exposition, you may be wondering why I like this guy so much. He doesn't seem like the nicest guy in the world, and he certainly isn't. He is, however, insanely hilarious in most every line of dialogue he speaks. Whether it be crappy pretzels, Hey! How did, how did pretzels suck? How's your day been, buddy? A diamond horse, I, I should probably clarify, the diamond horse I've been telling you about? It's not a sculpture or anything. It's a living horse that actually happens to be made of... What, yeah, actually, I'll just, I'll go get her. Butt Stallion! Here, girl! Butt Stallion! It, it, say hello! Yeah. <laughs> Butt Stallion says hello. Or the ability to fly. Okay. <laughs> Run! You're the only one running, pal! I can fly! Everything this guy says is funny. 
Well, Get I'm ready to it. lick my boots, you raging douchebag! Though he is kind of a jerk, he's extremely likable. He's the kind of guy who could insult you to your face and you would laugh. Character-wise, he has clear goals, a clear-cut personality, and an interesting backstory. He's incredibly interesting and funny, and surprisingly human. Compared to everyone else, he's basically the main character of the Borderlands games, driving the plot in each and every one of them. I felt bad when I killed him, because he only wanted to bring peace and order to Pandora. I only did it myself, as Lilith would have been much more brutal, I'm sure. I agree with Matt Pat's game theory. He truly is the hero of this story. Number 2 Wario, Super Mario Land 2 Keeping with the theme of Narcissus, number 2 is Wario. Where to begin? I already explained him in great detail in this video, so some points may be repeated. Wario is a greedy treasure hunter slash video game maker who cares about money before all else. Ever since I was a kid I found him to be really cool. He's super strong, pretty quick for his build, and that mustache is just awesome. I mean, just look at it. It takes talent to maintain a stash such as that. I'm not entirely sure why he became my favorite Mario character so early on. I guess I just thought he was cooler than the rest. Or maybe the stash. Yeah, probably that. First appearing as the final boss in Super Mario Land 2, Wario quickly became popular, spawning his own franchise, Wario Land. These games are very fun, Shake It being one of my all-time favorite games. The platforming is good, I love the art style, and the treasure collecting is addicting. The bosses are a blast, and it has freaking Wario anime cutscenes for crying out loud. He then gained yet another franchise, the WarioWare games. Ditching his plumber attire and adorning a biker vest and helmet as he runs his company, WarioWare Incorporated, and cashes in on the video game craze. However, due to his lazy attitude, and to save precious cash, he decided to create short 5 second games, too short to be called mini games, instead dubbed micro games. He's my main in Smash Bros, and for good reason. His quick, strong, unpredictable nature plays into his fighting style of punches, bites, farts, and even motorcycles. After eating his favorite food, garlic, he even transforms into his alter ego, Wario Man. Wario Man is here to save the world. Of all of its money. He's faster and stronger than Wario, I can even fly. His farts are especially deadly, dealing a one-hit KO when fully charged. His attitude mainly revolves around himself, and how awesome he is. I'm a number one! His motivations throughout the games he appears in are usually either money or revenge on Mario. He hates that guy. I'm not too fond of him either, if I'm honest. Though he is quick to anger, he's usually content, always having a wide smile on his face. Then again, that may just be because he has no lips. You'll never be able to unsee it now. His games even have my favorite music overall. Shake It has my favorite soundtrack, and the WarioWare theme is absolutely amazing. Just listen to this. That's what I call music. All in all, great character. In any game he's available, Wario is always my number one choice to play as. Honorable Mentions Number 1 Doug, The Walking Dead You may be thinking to yourself, what? Why? How is Doug better than all of these other characters previously listed? When I first played The Walking Dead, I absolutely loved it. The characters, the art style, the choices were all so enveloping. When I met Doug in-game, I saw he was probably the most intelligent person in the group, which I always admire. 
He's good with computers, likes video games, it was all around a general nerd. When the choice came down to either Carly or Doug, originally I paused the game and thought for a very long time. But eventually, it came down to this. Us geeks gotta stick together. Once I saved Doug, I felt good. I knew I'd saved one of the truly good people left on Earth. Many of the things he says and does are funny, and his genius does often help the group. Even without any survival skills, he saved himself and Carly from their new studio, which was overrun with walkers. The dynamic of Doug and Carly is really sad too, as the two are finally beginning to confess their love for one another, only for one to have to die for the other to survive. Eventually in episode 3, Doug becomes a true hero, sadly sacrificing himself to save a friend from being shot by Lily. Though his death was premature and sad, he had an impact on me. After I, of course, abandoned Lily, I realized why I liked Doug so much. I saw myself in him. We are truly similar in many ways. We're both smart and studious as well as nerdy. Kind at heart, but awkward and not exactly skilled at things other than technology. As well as always ready to help those we care about. Heck, we even kind of look similar. This is why he is the theme of my channel. Why the bear is my emblem, and why I wear his shirt in almost every video. He may not be the strongest, or the coolest, or the most skilled, but he represents all that is human. He can't do everything perfectly. He isn't an over-exaggerated hero. He's just a nerdy guy trying to keep himself and those he cares about alive. He's my favorite video game character, and that is not going to change. Thank you all so much for watching. This took a long time to make, and I feel it may be the greatest video I've made yet. If you enjoyed, liking or sharing this video would be greatly appreciated. Feel free to tell me your favorite video game character down in the comments below. Subscribe for more gaming related videos and I will see you guys next time. Peace.